So you're kind of assuming, yeah, this part is here, or a kind of a random fluctuations contributed to all kinds of other things. But here, we have a substantial drop. Therefore, we could probably suggest a model with 10, 15 variables, no need to go all the way up. But it's highly subjective. I mean, if you're interested in winning a competition, you'll pick the highest point here. But at least you run this experiment to see what's going to happen and uh, whether you'll gain some useful insights. And we do it all the time. That's why we have battery shaving. That's why we have that uh, important automation approach. Every project that we've done over the past five years heavily rotates around this machinery. Originally, we did not have it part of CART. Uh, and I remember I had to write Perl scripts that would execute CART engine, the grab the variable importance list, extract the least important variable, automatically rewrite the command file, execute CART engine again, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you ever want to uh, kind of uh, cause a lot of headache to your junior programmers, assign them this task, and they'll have a lot of fun with it. Uh, the sixth challenge, assessment of interactions. It's a very useful topic. And again, we rely on the tree net uh, to investigate these kinds of things. I know Dan Steinberg had a whole talk dedicated to that topic, so I'm going to just skip over some of the uh, key highlights here. Well, first of all, notice CART and RF, by their very nature, allow high-level interactions. So you can't really uh, restrict either CART or RF models to work with low-level interactions. It's just impossible because, because of the hierarchical nature of the trees. But not so with TreeNet and Mars. It's extremely easy to disable interactions whatsoever and force these models to become generalized additive in nature. And therefore, our recommendation, at the very least, if you don't want to go into all these fancy TreeNet Pro capabilities with interaction control lists and so on and so forth, at the very least, try what happens when you run additive model, two-way interactions model, three-way, and perhaps uh, more, depending on your patience. What you will see is oftentimes something like that. For example, in the Asian KDD 2007, the top run shows what happens when you run three-way interactions, which is basically six node trees. Uh, what happens is that because of the individual trees are allowed to be larger, uh, there is the overfitting gap between learned sample performance and test sample performance, so that the overall test uh, area under ROC curve is 0.714. But if you change it, and run it in a strictly additive fashion, of course, you would uh, have to change some of the controls and settings. What happened in that example is that the overfitting gap was eliminated. So additive model did a better job at tra tracking learn uh, versus test performance. And it actually resulted, you may not see it here because it's, it's a bit of a mess up on the picture, but the actual number was a slightly above the number of the up above. So you reduced the model complexity by keeping only main effects. And at the same time, the overall performance went up. And now, this is not something that will happen all the time. In many cases, running additive models will slightly reduce performance. And there will also be cases when running additive models will dramatically reduce the performance. Those cases are of particular interest because they would be clear indication that there is a substantial amount of interactivity within your data set that cannot be safely discarded. A very simple and trivial test opens up many doors. And trust me, once you step on that road, it is going to confuse the hell out of you. I mean, in terms of the mind and the things that you will start realizing. You will realize that the entire concept of interactions in a nonlinear fashion in all of these, kind of in the presence of multicollinearity and the winner dependencies, is a, a kind of unclearly defined uh, subject to begin with. Now, no time to go deeper into that, but certainly very uh, interesting capabilities. 
Now, there is another challenge. It has to deal with the conventional card runs that have been out there for so long. Uh, but believe it, uh, I mean, uh, believe it or not, it took us more than 10 years to realize a very simple fact that uh, changing prior probabilities has a profound impact on the shape of the uh, ROC curve or the gains curve. And, I mean, it's, it's a very natural thing, come to think about it. And what, what, it's, what is really important to understand here is that priors enter into the game at such an early stage so that all of the internal, internally calculated within node probabilities, improvements, impurities, etc., etc., become fundamentally altered when you change your vector of priors. And it is a part of our standard cottage training. I dedicate one or two hours working all, I mean, going over all these formulas, highlighting the differences and what is really happening. But from the practical standpoint, here is what happens. I took the prior probability on class one, I have a binary problem, and I reduced it from 0.9, which is the blue curve, to 0.7, red curve, and finally to 0.5, green curve. And what happens to my ROC curve is that with a very large prior, I'm getting this blue one here, I'm not getting a steep initial segment. But as the prior probability goes down, I'm forcing my model to go steeper initially in that class. Uh, and at the same time, I'm going to lose part of the kind of uh, the trade-off in the upper parts of the curve. And you know, the gains curve is always, I mean, the ROC curve in this case, uh, the ROC curve kind of symmetric. It doesn't matter whether you pick one class or another. You can kind of flip it upside down and rotate 90 degrees to get to what happens in the other class. And uh, the picture in class one is the exact opposite to picture in class zero. So by changing priors, you are effectively changing all of the internal trade-offs, and you're forcing the entire cart machinery to go either more or less aggressively after the given class. And in our training, I show the theoretical and underlying mathematical reasons and foundations why that is happening. It also uh, explains why you know, some people say, especially if you go to other vendors, uh, they say, here is a tree. We don't support priors per se. So you can build a tree first, say a class probability tree. But then you can pick your own uh, kind of threshold and you can basically partition yourself in different parts of the curve to make the trade-off between class assignments to zeros and ones. Well, what CART is doing is much deeper because it's not only changing the curve, uh, the kind of the position of the points of the, on the curve, but it influences the entire trade-off balance itself one way or another. Keep that in mind, unless if you want to use priors, they have to be incorporated into the core of the model building itself. And it cannot be used as a simple post-processing operation because by the time you have your model, there's a large number of decisions have already been made and they were geared to one specific, either explicit or implicit set of priors.